Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to our worship service here at Annual Big McCann on the sixth Sunday after Pentecost. We also welcome those who are worshiping with us at home. The words on the bulletin cover come from our gospel lesson, which is also our sermon text for today, where Jesus says, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. Seems confusing, isn't it? A word spoken by the Prince of Peace, who came to bring peace between a holy God and sinful human beings, but we'll, we'll see that Jesus wants to give us a realistic view of our life as his disciples. But where there are swords, there are many more rewards. We'll see that in our sermon for today. Due to the recent spike and increase of the COVID cases that are testing positive in our state and our community, uh, the leaders of our churches have decided that we'll ask the worshipers to not sing at all, uh, but we'll ask our cantor to do all the singing, the hymns, uh, the, the psalm refrain, and then the liturgical songs. I hope you'll understand. And of course, I'll, I'll still do the readings. We invite you then to join in the readings of the Confession of Sins, the Creed, and the Lord's Prayer. May God bless our worship service today as our soloist leads us in our opening hymn, uh, 185, O Holy Spirit, Grant Us Grace. sins. 
Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For the well-being of your holy church and all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Amen. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. O Lord, O Lord, O Lord. Through all generations. 
I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. The heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness too in the assembly of the Holy One. Man, because he is a righteous man, will receive a righteous man's reward. 
And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. This is the gospel of our Lord. In 453, come follow me, the Savior's Lord.
Lord Jesus, speak to us through your holy word. Teach us what it means to follow you. Give us a realistic view of a disciple's life that probably will have swords, but certainly will have many more rewards. Amen. It's great to have a guest preacher last Sunday, especially since it was my uh, son-in-law, Justin Digman, who finished his first year at the seminary. And recall where he took us, right? He invited us to the king's palace where his servants were brought before him, one who owed 10,000 talents and unpayable bill. But after this servant asked for mercy, the, the king surprisingly forgave him. Illogical forgiveness. Well, from the king's palace last Sunday, we go to the, the wedding hall this Sunday, the wedding reception, where we meet the happy couple, bride and groom, Tom and Kathy. And uh, they're uh, Kathy's uncle and aunt, Uncle Bob and Aunt Jane. Service is over, uh, pictures are taken, uh, dinner's over, and the dancing has begun. Of course, the bride and groom are on the dance floor. And after a few more dances, they're all tuckered out, and so they start going around the different tables to greet the people at the reception. And uh, it's uh, Kathy that comes over to your table. Uncle Bob, Aunt Jane, and sits down. Thanks for coming. And Uncle Bob says, you know, Kathy, thanks for reminding us. But I want to tell you something. Listen carefully. Marriage takes work. And let me tell you about it. Let me give you a realistic view of what it takes uh, what marriage takes. You know, uh, Jane and I, we got married 35 years ago, and we struggled. Honestly, we struggled. It was tough finding a job or holding on to a job, and then uh, renting a little flat. Uh, God blessed us with our first child, uh, baby bills, hospital bills, and then a, a second child. We had to move out of our flat into a house, and then a mortgage. I had to get a second job. I was, out of, I was away from home for too long. We nearly separated. We, we spoke the D word. It was hard. And it's, uh, Kathy was thinking, Uncle oh, Bob, it's my wedding day. Why uh, start raining on a sunny day? Thinking maybe, shouldn't I have even gotten married? I just wanted to give you a realistic view of marriage. In a similar way, I think Jesus wants to give us, his disciples then and now, a realistic view of what it means to follow him. Right? We just sang that, or our soulists did, come follow me. Deny yourselves, the world forsake. Take your crosses and follow me. That there probably will be swords, there will be challenges that you face, like Uncle Bob explained to his niece, but there will be plenty also rewards, blessings, more than you can count, none of which you deserve. You know, the opening verse that I just read that's printed on the bulletin covers rather um, a shock when you hear Jesus saying this, right? Do not think I have come to bring peace, I have come to bring a sword. But what did Isaiah foretell? You know, back in Isaiah chapter 9, he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, what? Prince of Peace. What did the angels say to the shepherds? Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. And then uh, 40 days after that first Christmas, when Mary and Joseph went to the temple uh, for the rite of purification presented to Jesus, baby Jesus, to the temple, they met a man named Simeon, who had been promised that he would die until he had seen the, the, the promised Savior. And he not only saw him, he held him in his arms. And he sang that song that is so, so familiar to us, the nunc dimittis, now dismiss. Now, Lord, dismiss your servant. For mine eyes have seen your salvation. Dismiss your servant in peace. 
And if you follow Simeon's conversation with uh, Mary, Joseph, and baby Jesus, he also makes a prophecy. He said, This child will cause a rising and falling, and many in Israel, his name will be spoken against. In other words, not everybody's going to believe in him as the Savior. And then you know what Simeon told Mary? And a sword will pierce your own soul too. Wow. Talk about rain clouds at a, a wedding reception or at the birth of your child at the temple. What did Simeon mean? How would Mary's soul be pierced? Well, maybe when Jesus was 12 years old and reminded his mother that, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Or at the beginning of his ministry when he came home to Nazareth and he read that scroll of Isaiah, the promise of the coming Savior, and then he claimed to be that coming Savior. This scripture is now fulfilled in your hearing. And what do the people in, in town want to do? His own family? Throw them over the cliff. Now, Jesus, uh, Mary saw a sword. Jesus in his own life, where some of his brothers didn't even believe in him. Uh, saying that he's demon-possessed, he's out of his mind. And then when Mary and the brothers show up and say, that we would like to talk with Jesus, Jesus refuses, stays inside, says, my mother and brother want to talk with me? Who are my mother and brothers? Those who do the will of my father, they are my true mother and brothers. Certainly there are swords in our life as Christians, just like Mary, Jesus. The crosses that we bear because we believe in the one who died on the cross to pay, take, take away our sins. Some are self-inflicted. Uh, beds that we made and now are lying in it. Some have come from the outside. When you live your faith, you are a target. A criticism. Attack. And now, for the last three, four months, this whole virus thing going around the world, forcing us to wear masks, staying six feet apart, and, and, and then now you can't even sing the hymns on Sunday? Crosses that we are bearing, tests that God is giving us as he calls us to repent and to rely not on ourselves, but on him for forgiveness, life, and salvation. But here specifically, Jesus talks about the swords that we bear in our family situations, both our home family and our, even our church family. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father. A daughter against her mother. A daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Am I worthy of Jesus? Are you? What is Jesus saying here? He's saying, put me first in your life. And even though family is important to you, your, your spouse, your kids, your grandkids, Jesus said, put me first in your life. By dropping on your knees, confessing your sins that we found this morning. By looking to the cross for forgiveness, life, salvation. Let, let nothing, including family, come between me and you. Easier said than done, right? Even in a pastor's family. I'm not going to get into details, but I haven't spoken with one of my sisters in years. After some of the things that well, maybe she's said and done. Uh, while we gathered for church on a Sunday, I know a couple brothers probably are out fishing or golfing today. Now they have slipped away from church and help way, not away from faith. Maybe you can think of examples uh, in your family as well. You don't need to share them with me. Where there's a sword that has divided 
a mother and father, sister and brother, parent and child. One believes, one doesn't. One follows Jesus, one doesn't. And your heart's brave, right? Like Mary, a sword will pierce your own soul, too, as you've seen your families torn apart. It happens in a church family, too, you know. Uh, Satan does not uh, rest, especially in God's house. This is where he really plans his attacks. As he gets people, members, leaders, to second-guess their decisions, especially during this difficult time of the COVID-19, when we all like to get together to worship without masks and singing the hymns, etc., etc. Realistic look at a disciple's life. That's what Jesus wants to give us, just like Uncle Bob wanted to give his niece, Kathy. But Uncle Bob's, uh, his conversation with Kathy on uh, that uh, wedding reception didn't end there with the uh, rain clouds. He says, no, Kathy, what you did today was a wonderful blessing. Because there are certainly a lot more rewards than swords. Jane and I have been married 35 years. Look at the kids. They're out there dancing on the floor. In fact, one of them is expecting our first grandchild here in a few months. Think of the blessings that God has in store for you. You both are Christians. You both believe in Jesus as your Savior. Boy, that's a great start. But the, the intimate relationship, the, the uh, partnership that you'll have, and Lord willing, God blesses you with family as he did for us. Sure, you're going to face challenges, but you'll also face so many rewards, especially knowing that Jesus is that third partner in your marriage. You'll be able to forgive each other, like we learned last Sunday, just like Jesus first forgave you. What are our rewards? Well, first of all, let's define reward. Grace. Remember that acronym from a couple weeks ago? God's riches at Christ's expense. It's a gift. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. What is our reward? Uh, it's free for us because Jesus paid for it on the cross and the open tomb. It's the forgiveness of our sins. It's our new life in Christ. Our life as God's children, his disciples, his apostles. Even bearing crosses, and of course it's our eternal life in heaven. Something that's out of this world that money can't buy. But now, Jesus goes on and talks about specific rewards. He says, he who receives you, receives me. And he who receives me, receives the one who sent me. Again, reminding us that we are apostles, disciples, sent out to preach the gospel, uh, to have that Christ-like compassion that we can communicate. Because when we say something, whether it's a verse in the Bible or a truth, it's really Jesus speaking through us to others. That's one reward right there. And he goes on, anyone who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. What's a prophet? It's not just a preacher. It's a spokesman. Anyone who speaks God's word, whether it's a verse you memorized or read, or a truth from the Bible. Parents do that. Siblings do that. Grandparents do that. I remember reading a book to a couple of my granddaughters about Jesus. Priceless. They took a video of it. The prophet's reward. To know that God is using us to touch the hearts of little ones. And anyone who receives a righteous man because he's a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. Who is righteous before God? On our own, no one. But we learn in Romans chapter 3 that a righteousness from God, apart from law and me, has been made known. The righteous will live by faith. That through faith in Jesus, we not only have our sins washed away, we've been clothed with his righteousness. And that knowing what we're wearing helps us what we do and 
how we live. We live an upright life as God's righteous children. And finally, if you give even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. And this covers everything else, doesn't it? Not only to share the, you know, the priceless message of Jesus with our, our grandkids or our kids or others in our lives, but to see where they are hurting, what need help they need, and to offer that help, even if it's just a cold cup of water. So you see, Uncle Bob, he had good intentions at that wedding reception. Uh, calling his niece, Kathy, aside and saying, you know, marriage takes work. There's going to be swords, but there certainly will be rewards. Our Christian life takes work. It's Jesus who did the, the wonderful work of saving us. And now he give us, gives us crosses to bear. He says, anyone who would come after me must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever loses his life will find it. Find Jesus and the full life we have as his children. God grant that for Jesus' sake. Amen. And may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand and join me as we confess our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life 